Okay, the next uh, paper is by Kakan Chuk, um, and, and he's from uh, the Institute of uh, Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Oxford uh, in a doctoral program. But basically, uh, Hong Kong. So. You're, and he's from Hong Kong. Yeah. He's doing a, his doctorate degree yeah. at Oxford right now. And the topic of the paper is Indians in the Chinese textile city, middlemen traders in upgrading economy. And the two uh, commentators, uh, the first one is Akbar Abbas. Also from Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> also from Hong Kong, <laughs> bounding there. Um, depart from the Department of, uh, uh, currently in the Department of Comparative Literature, University of California at Irvine. And the second one is Tansen Sen. Not from, from Hong Kong. Not from Hong Kong. Uh, uh, his home institute, institution is Baruch College in the city, University of New York, but he's currently visiting Singapore. Uh, yeah, visiting Singapore. Yeah, for the year. Also from Singapore, okay. Um, so, okay, I, uh, first we'll ask Akbar to, yeah. uh, you have eight okay. minutes. All right, yeah. so I'm going to try to beat the clock. Can we synchronize? No, don't start yet. Okay, it's not now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Let's see um, how good a fake that watch right, is. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try and combine summary uh, commentary and provocation all into one. Right? It, to save time, but not just to save time. Uh, Kaikin's fascinating urban ethnography about the, the role of the Indian middlemen in the Chinese textile industry, uh, centered in uh, uh, Kerchow, raises many, uh, raises more wide-ranging questions than its title suggests, it seems to me. Uh, the essay is divided into three parts and a brief concluding remark. I will um, summarize and comment on each part uh, uh, one by one. Uh, part one is the introduction. In the 80s, uh, he tells us the town of Kerchow emerged as the national center for the Chinese textile industry. As the textile trade became more global and export-oriented, Indian middlemen emerged in tandem with this uh, globalizing process. The state has since introduced many upgrade and development projects to improve Kerchow's textile industry. But these upgrades uh, have not included any thinking about the role of the Indian middleman. So Carl uh, Kint's essay addresses exactly this oversight through an ethnographic study of the whole process by which Indian middlemen uh, embedded themselves in Kirchhau's uh, now global textile industry. And the essay shows too that in order to understand any one particular case like this one, we have to consider a larger framework and moreover, this larger framework is a framework that cons that's constantly changing, introducing in the process new and not fully understood modes of connection and interaction. And it is these new modes, among other things, that the essay directs our attention to. Now, Kagan notes a kind of love-hate relation among Chinese traders to the Indian uh, middleman. And this might bring to mind um, the, uh, another figure, namely the comprador figure in the era of the treaty, port, uh, uh, treaty ports, who were both feared and hated. But to mention the comprador is to underline how different the figure of the Indian middleman is. The comprador, you remember, was a Chinese local who served foreign business interests and facilitated the capitalist colonialist uh, penetration of China. By contrast, the Indian uh, middleman operates in the context of, a chi of China as a rising global power, and also a power that is experiencing a paradox that the USA has, uh, that the USA knows only too well. Uh, the paradox that the more powerful you become, the more dependent you are. Power then is freedom and autonomy on the, un on the one hand, but also dependency and paranoia on the other. In 1998, China weathered the Asian financial crisis relatively unscathed by turning to its uh, vast domestic markets. But in 2012, the game is vastly different and, and, and bigger. Uh, 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 the more China becomes integrated to a global economy, the more difficult this strategy of looking homeward 
to the domestic market becomes. Now, this leads to the second part of the essay, uh, and promisingly, it seems to me, uh, entitled Company <coughs> Registration, but it's, it's fascinating subtext. It's uh, what an ethnography of the Indian middleman and his experience of working in China can tell us about China's political, economic, and cultural situation today. Uh, to begin with, China's Byzantine company registration system for foreign companies, uh, from getting visas to uh, opening bank accounts and so on, may seem unnecessarily complicated, uh, like the law in Kafka. But it serves to, uh, um, to assert the fact, it seems to me, that China uh, uh, today is a sovereign power and that the days of extraterritoriality, when imperial powers could impose their own rules, are long over. Now, the real interest of the section, however, it seems to me, is in, the, um, is in following how the Indian middleman has to find ways of exploiting loopholes in the system that allow him to bypass all these strict bureaucratic laws. Uh, ways that include opening a bank account in the name of, for example, a Chinese national who may be just a, an, office, uh, 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 an office girl. Um, now, this proceeding through loopholes raises, it seems to me, a really interesting point, and perhaps a, a slightly controversial one. The fact that many things in China today, uh, note, I'm not saying everything, that many things in China today, uh, um, uh, in spite of or because of the, uh, 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 of the irksome bureaucracy, are done in a quasi-legal fashion. The law is a little like traffic lights in Beijing. It exists, but you can't take it at face value. <laughs> when the light turns green, it doesn't always mean you have the exclusive right of way. Sometimes it means that, sometimes it doesn't. When it shows red, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop. Now, this quasi-legal uh, system suggests that almost everything is negotiable. Now, in the best case scenario, it means that things are done not by insisting on one's uh, 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 rights as defined by law, but by finding a solution more or less satisfactory to all parties uh, despite the law. I think this was what Madhu was uh, uh, referring to as communitarian law earlier. Now, of course, in the worst case scenario, it means rampant bribery and corruption. Right, uh, uh, the, the Vosheli case is just the, the most recent one. So the quasi, this quasi-legal gives us the strange sense that we are dealing uh, um, uh, both with an old culture, with its uh, own inherited ways of doing things, as well as with its opposite, a kind of frontier mentality. Uh, the Wild East, not the Wild West. But it's a frontier mentality with a difference. Because in China today, the frontier is located not only at the frontier, but has migrated, as it were, uh, to the heart of every major Chinese city, uh, including uh, Kerchow itself. So globalization uh, then gives us not just uh, uh, space-time compression, which is probably the, the most pernicious thing ever said about globalization by David Harvey. Uh, but rather something much more ambiguous uh, and complex, and something that we really have to suss out through uh, careful readings of particular situations. Now, I have three more sections, which I'll just skip. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. okay. Okay. So, time's okay. up. <laughs> okay. I read it out. I thought, uh, oh, yeah, I'll have eight. Uh, but I'll that's have have no question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> we have half a minute, I guess, okay. that we saved up from earlier. Well, uh, you have shall, shall, I, shall, shall I do the next minute. section? Shall I quickly do the next one? Right. Now, this brings us to the third part. Again, austerely, uh, austerely entitled Work and Business Experience. Because the real questions, it seems to me, that this part asks is, what is the nature of the middleman's contribution to the textile industry? And how did these Indians acquire uh, this uh, expertise? Now, to begin with, Kaken notes that the Indian middlemen both serve and depend on their Chinese host. In other words, the relation is a symbiotic one. What this necessary symbiosis points to is firstly a change uh, or even a split in the nature of the commodity uh, uh, itself. Uh, there are, for example, material goods like textiles, 
but there are also other kinds of goods, like service and informational goods, which are immaterial, but in today's uh, global economy, just as real and valuable. Now, secondly, the essay shows that the Indian middleman acquired his expertise by his knowledge of trade, uh, namely his knowledge of trade networks and connections as a direct result of a historical crisis, uh, namely the uh, partition of India. Uh, it is at this point that we learn that the middleman is not just Indian, uh, he is Sindhi. And the Sindhis are Hindus who left their homes which were uh, in what is now Pakistan. The Sindhis then are business people whose experience of deracination and migration allowed them to keep moving and to keep networking. Uh, they did not stop in India uh, either, but crossed the Arabian Seas to set up trade companies in Dubai. So the pioneers of the tex uh, and the pioneers of the textile industry in Dubai uh, were the South Koreans. But because of the Sindhis' knowledge of English, uh, they quickly uh, replaced the South Koreans as the main middlemen traders uh, 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 in, in Dubai. And it's this wide knowledge of trade networks that the uh, Sindhi middleman brings as his contribution to the Chinese uh, textile industry. Can I have 30 more seconds? Yes. Then I'll finish, right. Now, we might push the point further and ask here, what exactly is the Indian middleman uh, 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 selling? What kind of labor? is the middleman's uh, labor. And the question and the answer might be uh, what uh, we might call fetic labor. Now, um, examples of the fetic might be, when we, when we ask on the telephone, do you hear me? Uh, which is checking on whether the lines of communication are open. Or when we engage in small talk, like uh, 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 asking, have you eaten yet? or uh, how are you doing, right? uh, perfectly meaningless sentences, right? which have an important function, nevertheless, uh, to signal a willingness to communicate. So the middleman allows a kind of connection between producer and, and buyer by opening up the best lines of communication. And as such, he stands between modes uh, 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 of direct face-to-face -face communication on the one hand, and the facelessness of information technologies on the other to act as a kind of interface. Uh, how long this symbiosis uh, 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 of middlemen and hosts will last is still an open question. Now, con the concluding remarks, uh, less than a page long, summarizes the argument, but also asserts, interestingly, one last point. Uh, he says, I'm quoting now, middlemen traders are definitely not outsiders. But, of course, we, we can also say they're just as definitely not insiders uh, either. Uh, so an ethnographic study might ask, well, what then, in fact, are they? They're neither insiders nor outsiders. Now, one possibility is, is the figure that uh, someone like Georg Simmel uh, introduced a long time ago, the figure of the stranger. The stranger, uh, uh, to quote Simmel, is not the wanderer who comes today and goes tomorrow, but rather the man who comes today and stays, to, stays tomorrow. And it is such strangers, I'm addressing this remark to Katya now, it is such strangers that created a city like Hong Kong. Uh, their ult uh, and their ultimate impact on Kerchow still remains to be determined. Sorry. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. OK. Let's move to okay. Tencent. Yeah, I, I think uh, what Kachin does is actually argue that uh, the Indian middlemen play an important role in making Kerchiao an important uh, trading center uh, by uh, using their networks uh, of trade. Uh, but putting, putting the study in the context uh, of, of study of Indian diaspora in, in China, uh, we all know that uh, Parsis and, and even Sindhis were present in China during the colonial period. Uh, there are a number of books on, on that topic. Uh, but uh, this phenomena, uh, especially about uh, the contemporary uh, Chinese uh, cities with Indian population is pretty new one. Uh, starting f uh, after 1962, uh, and especially in the 1980s, you find uh, the initial uh, so-called Indian middleman. And why he's calling a middleman is because the trade is not towards India, but in the, in the third country, right? Uh, it's, it's, it goes, uh, the Indian middlemen are sourcing the commodities from China and, and sending it not to South Asia, not to India, but to a third country. 
Uh, that started in the 80s when, when uh, Indian middlemen were actually procuring uh, Chinese textiles and sending it to Soviet Union uh, because in exchange of that, they were getting Indian rupees from Soviet Union because India uh, owed a lot to the Soviet Union and one of the ways uh, the Soviets were uh, giving the money was through Indian rupees. So the Indian middlemen existed uh, since the 80s before Kirtia became uh, an important place for textile uh, export. Uh, he's also doing something uh, very important. He is uh, looking at the Pakistanis who are also in, in Kirtia and, and trying to distinguish the Indian middlemen from the Pakistani traders. Uh, the Indians dealing with high-end textiles, the Pakistani dealing with the low-end textiles, uh, and, and, and textiles going to Pakistan uh, instead of uh, entering this global uh, network. Uh, his, his argument uh, about this, this Indian Sindhi network is, is quite important, uh, how textiles from, from China uh, enters into this network and goes to Dubai and other places. Uh, and I wonder how the WTO rules uh, in that uh, case matter, that why it's not coming to India but going to the other places. So his, his, uh, uh, in the context of the study of Indian uh, diaspora in China, and, and what we see is uh, such diasporas emerging in Guangzhou, near Guangzhou and Foshan, for example. Uh, and and Keqiao, those of you who don't know, is located near Shaoxing in Zhejiang province. Uh, and, and, and in Guangdong, they have uh, other Indian uh, diasporas dealing with different kinds of commodities. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, Kachin is perhaps one of the very few uh, people who have looked at this new phenomena of, of Indian diasporic communities uh, in, in, in China. Um, and uh, the, since uh, Akbar has already summarized uh, most of his essay, uh, I, I just want to focus on some of the issues, questions that perhaps uh, he could uh, answer. Uh, first, with the, with, the, with, with the registration, one of the things I, I couldn't figure out is why uh, you are not using some of the statistics. If you are going to argue uh, that the Indian middlemen play an, an important role in making Kirchhau uh, uh, leading trading center, do we know exactly the volume of trade they are engaged in? Uh, how much of the commodity are they exporting uh, out of the total commodity, right? So, so that you can make your case that most of the trade is, is managed by the Indian middlemen. Is that the case? Uh, I, I didn't see any, any numbers there, right? I mean, uh, South Koreans, Pakistanis, in, in the whole, uh, what is the volume of trade we are talking about that is handled by the Indian middlemen? Um, the networks. Uh, how do the networks actually work? Uh, you are saying it, it goes to Dubai. What is the mechanism through which these textiles are taken to Dubai or any other places? Uh, is it all through a Sindhi network, or, or the network also includes other non-South Asians uh, that are taking commodities from Dubai? But Dubai is perhaps not the consumption place. It's going beyond Dubai, right? Dubai is, a, again, a middle place, a transit center. Uh, and and how, where the textile uh, is ending up, where is the demand of this Kirchhau textile? Finally, eventually. Um, the other issue is, is a methodological issue. Uh, I think you, you stress many times you are doing uh, an anthropological study. Uh, and those of you who have read, uh, read his, his uh, uh, I'm going to follow Peter and not follow the rules. Um, uh, <laughs> just joking. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, you are taking my time away. <laughs> Uh, what 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 Kajin does is uh, his sources are basically uh, people he talks to, uh, Indian businessmen in Kirtiao, the Chinese people who interact with, with them. So his, his uh, a main source of information are these informants. How reliable are they, right? Uh, and and uh, there are other anthropological issues. Uh, if you are talking about this Indian diaspora, there's whole literature about diasporic communities. Uh, you you talk about a Gurdwara, uh, the Sindhis he is talking about are Sikhs, uh, not 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 Hindus or or Sufis. Uh, so what role does that uh, that uh, Gurdwara play in this uh, middleman community in in, in China? Uh, that part you absolutely don't don't uh, talk about the community and its issues, right? Uh, and and uh, if you are doing anthropological research, perhaps 
not including that, but their relationship to the Chinese beyond just a business thing. You at, at some point mentioned that one of the Chinese person said uh, that I don't like doing business with them, these Indians. Uh, why? What, 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 is it, what is the reason why he does not like to do business, uh, especially considering the EU case, right, where uh, the two Indian traders were tortured? Uh, 15 minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, the other thing is, is uh, putting things into the context. Uh, where does the Khrushchev Indian diasporic community fit in the larger uh, Indian diasporic communities elsewhere in China? In Foshan, uh, in, in perhaps Hangzhou, where there are IT uh, specialists, uh, and other places. And also, in the previous uh, times, when there were Indian diasporic communities there, including Sindhis in Xinjiang. Uh, so how, how do that ancient or older Indian diasporic communities, their working, their dealings, their experience in China compared to these people in Khrushchev? Uh, what, what, is, what is it that, that w w we can compare from the preceding period to the, the, the contemporary period? Also, uh, with regard to the context is, now that we have these Indian diasporic uh, communities in China, what does it mean for India-China interactions? <coughs> right? This, this is a, a, a symposium on India-China interactions. Does the presence of uh, Indian communities in China in any way have a significant Im impact on India-China relations or no? Do diasporic communities matter in the mutual understanding or does it create problems? Uh, where does it fit? And lastly, uh, your, your sources, uh, uh, I mean, you seem to be very much dependent on this informants. Uh, I mean, if you go to the Indian embassy in China or the Indian consulate general's uh, offices in, in Shanghai and Guangzhou, they have detailed records about the presence of Indians and, and some of the cases, court cases going on. Was there a reason why you did not consult those uh, sources or even statistical records of the export uh, of, of commodities, and in particular, when you are talking about the registration, there must be somewhere uh, uh, registration reports of how many Indian companies uh, are being registered. His way of, of calculating is going to these places and counting the numbers of Indian offices uh, in, in various buildings. Uh, but why not go to the registration office where there are official applications, uh, perhaps getting those records and, and finding out actually how many companies are officially registered and are there companies that are not registered but still doing businesses. So uh, those are, I think I've given you many questions. I'm still not done, right? You have done. <laughs> okay. Ken, I want Thanks for the beautiful and constructive comments. I mean, it cannot come out from my mouth for sure, but come out of, coming out from their mouth is so beautiful and so constructive. So thank you so much. I mean, is that, is that okay or like? Yes. So a couple of issues here that I need to answer. Maybe I start from the methodology. Uh, actually, from the paper, I have a lot of codes for my informants. But in fact, most of the information or the analysis that I made in the paper uh, were from my uh, anthropological method, so-called participant observations. Because those Cindy businessmen, they look never be honest to researchers like me, as well as their Chinese suppliers. So, I mean, they have talked with me with quite a lot of things, but later I found out that it was all fake. <laughs> so, in that sense, I mean, I mean, as I see, I haven't talked that issues in the paper, but all the information that I got was not from the formal interview or survey, I mean, questionnaire or something like that. I, I hang out with them, drum with them, and get their mouth open to me and talk with me. And then I go home, I make my looks. It's like that. It's not formal interview because it's impossible to do that, especially when you consider it as a company business environment. I go to their office sometime, have tea, have some observations to see what they are going to talk or what, get, what they are going to do with those Chinese suppliers and their Indian buyers from Dubai, for example. Uh, but formal interview is really difficult. I have done some, but I found that all the information that I got from the formal interviews are not, I mean, reliable on the one hand and not useful on the other. 
So most of the data or the, how to say, the analysis in the paper that I make here uh, were from my own field experience, which is not, I mean, in-depth interviews or other kinds of formal sociological techniques. And another, then I move on to another issues in terms of the uh, statistics. Uh, two issues here. First one is like, um, of course I got a lot of like statistical reports from, for example, from the commercial bureaus. Uh, what is that in English? I, I cannot. Commercial. Commercial, commercial bureau or like, or business administration bureau. Because all the company, local company have to register with the Chinese government. I can get, I can get some number there. And also I can get the export number from the government published the report as well. But the problem is like, most of the Indian company register under the Chinese name. <laughs> so that's why, I mean, as Tan San said, what I did is that like I can't the company on my hand. Because I found out that the Indian company registered in China, especially, I mean, in Kershaw in particular, there are only 300. I can say even within one commercial building, because there are like, 10 or more commercial buildings in Kirtau, and each of them have at least 10 stories. And within one single building, you can find more than like 200 Indian companies. And actually, I don't have any PowerPoint here on this screen. I would like to show you some picture like Chinese name company, but what you can see is a Sai Baba statue inside. <laughs> well, except maybe some Chinese are also followers of Sai Baba, but if not, I mean, I'm sure that he is Indians. No, no, but, but the Chinese can be a follower of Sai Baba. I mean, of course, that's why I said I, I cannot 100% sure, but I mean, so the formal reports or the government reports, I mean, cannot reveal the actuality that is going on happened in Kerta. So all those formal numbers are very small. They just said, oh, we just have 1,000 1, Indians there formally registered with the local government, and we just had 300 trading companies run by Indians in Kirtau. But, I mean, I would say, <laughs> that's why I did, did not call it in my paper, because it cannot reflect the actuality. Of course, I would, because it's just a part of my thesis, I mean, PhD thesis research, I will talk about it deeply in my, in my report about the differences between the actuality and the report that you can find out from the South Sin government. And maybe I can talk one more minute? Okay. Uh, Indian embassies. I mean, as you, as Hansa just mentioned, like this year in January 2012, there was a trade dispute in Yiwu. Yiwu is another Zhejiang city in which you can find like at least 3,000 Indian traders. How close are they? Uh, three hours uh, train ride from Shaoxing to Yiwu. Actually, last week I was in Yiwu, <laughs> so it's very, very near. But there are no business relationship. I mean, there are some, because for example, many of my informants, cousins are in Yiwu. But they are not holding any kinds of business relationships, so in that sense, they are not closely related. But anyway, I mean, going back to that trade dispute story, on why it becomes such a scandal or becomes so hot in the international, how to say, media. Because one Indian embassy people was involved in that dispute. In a good way. And Indian government insulted a formal complaint to the Chinese government. And even like in January and in February, Indian embassy in Shanghai insulted a warning to all Indian citizens, no matter they're in India or overseas, that you should not do trade in Yiwu. So, as far as I know, I, want, I would love to interview the Indian embassy people in Shanghai. But at that moment, I fast them, I call them, I'm trying to find them through some personal connections, but they simply adore me. So if you, have, if you know some people, some friends in the embassy in Shanghai, please let me know, I would love to talk with them. <laughs> and on the other hand, I'm, I can trace that actually many Cindy's in Kirtau, they have personal relationship with the embassy people in Shanghai. So for example, like because all Indians have to renew their passport, because it's very trouble for foreigners to get a, how to say, get a visa in China, no matter your academics, no matter you are doing business. They just give you maybe one month visa, but your passport just has 10 page. So every page of your passport will be your Chinese visa. If you stay there for 10 years, for example, or 10 months, sorry. 
So, I mean, they need to renew the passport, right, in the Indian embassy in Shanghai. But they don't need to go there. I mean, in free with all the Indians in China, they need to go to Indian embassies in Shanghai or in Beijing to renew their passport. But some of the Sydney's in Shanghai, they can just call their friends in embassy and get their passport done. So in that sense, there are some personal or friends connections between the Sindhis in Kurtau as well as the Indians in the, I mean, working in the embassy. I'm, I'm still trying to dig that out, but it's really difficult. But I think it would be really interesting for Stephanie to see how those government issues are acting or are working out on a personal or on an everyday social level. Because it all may also reflect the final, your final point, the China-Indian relations. Because many Chinese government, they also want to get in touch with me to know, because I'm doing field work there, all the Chinese government will say, oh, this guy is doing field work. Because, I mean, the Chinese government also wants suspicious of all the Indian businessmen in Kirtau. So I was invited to have tea with the Chinese government official for some time. <laughs> but anyway, but all, it, it means that the, how to say, it's a very sensitive issue there. And if I can take it out, it may also contribute to a deeper understanding or broader understanding about the Indian-China governmental relationship. That's all, thank you. Okay, uh, questions, Sanjit? Uh, uh, yeah, this sounds like a very interesting study. I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to, is it on? Hello? Yeah, um, sorry, I haven't had a chance to read it. Uh, but what it also sounds to me <coughs> like is, um, also a relatively uh, under the radar kind of movement. Uh, and uh, this is in the realm of uh, global trade in general, I think. Uh, and particularly in China, uh, or with China. Uh, you know, I heard a paper not very long ago, which I can't remember too well. But anyway, what I think the argument there was that it was about South China. and bypassing Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is so expensive for traders from outside, and also for Chinese, uh, uh, um, petty traders from China and so on, who want to access these, these popular markets, right, in cheap goods and things like that. So what apparently in Hong Kong they do, or from Shenzhen and so on, uh, Shenzhen and other cities further up the Pearl River Delta, uh, they have special transportation mechanisms that bypass Hong Kong, uh, but that are regulated by local governments uh, out there. So they do manage to regulate. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine the kinds of goods that are coming are not coming in <coughs> freighted. They're coming in plastic bags and this, that, and they're going out, in and out and so on. Mm -hmm. So that realm, you know, there's an effort to regulate, mm -hmm. but it fights back through these various things. Uh, what is very interesting for me is, I mean, there's several questions I have around this, and I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't be taking time. But one is that very often these Sindhi traders mm -hmm. are actually transnationals mm -hmm. or transmigrants, <coughs> so they're not necessarily from India. Do they have Indian passports? Because they might have been in many different places, including Hong Kong mm -hmm. and, and Kobe and Dubai and you know all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, they move around, and they have these networks. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do they have these passports, and what is the relationship, and so on, could be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, Tansen's question to sort of develop it, I wonder how much they're also part of this vertical supply chain network, right? I mean, who else do they depend on And when it becomes global, right? Mm -hmm. And how does that whole network work especially when it's under the radar, <coughs> right? Mm. Uh, uh, anyway, for the moment, these are the kinds of questions I have. Mm. And I think uh, one very important question that he posed was the question of what they do to India-China relations. Mm. And uh, uh, the state-to-state, uh, -state, I mean, this is the state is being forced to acknowledge something that uh, is not really within their command. Mm. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating paper. I'm just looking for, I'm going to go back and download it and read it. <laughs> I just wanted to make one small clarification since I think it's important to the subject mm. and it's a really very small one for most Indians. See, the, the Sindhis are both Hindus and Sikhs. Yep. 
You see, they are Sikhs strictly. They're the followers of Guru Nanak. Yep. But they're Nanak Sahajdhari Nanak. Sikhs. Yep. The people who cut their hair off. Mm -hmm. And they are not treated by the Sikhs, the Khalsa Sikhs, mm -hmm. as Sikhs. Mm -hmm. In fact, they went so far as in the eight, between 1870 and 1911, 1818, 1911, after the census has started. Mm -hmm. When the census has started, they insisted on redefining Sikhism so that the population of Sikhs in India between uh, in a 20-year period between, I think it was 1901 and 1921, uh, de declined by, 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 by one-third. Mm -hmm. But this makes no sense at all, because they were all having children. Mm -hmm. But the point is that they redefined themselves. Right. So. And the, these are actually, they, I think they think of themselves as Hindus who are Sikhs. I think it is a good anthropological principle that if you cannot find out something, that you have to find out something else. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, business information uh, is very difficult to get. Right. Uh, so uh, maybe you shouldn't go there. And uh, the Cindy's Cindy are basically everywhere. Canary Islands, uh, they control commodities. Uh, they are in, in Holland, uh, some of them have now become big uh, textile magnates. Uh, the uh, uh, firm Max is uh, a big brand, in, in, uh, transnational brand, is owned by Cindy's who started uh, with small textile. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things would be to see how certain kinds of firms are, uh, uh, are developing. Yeah. But the other thing which you can look at is uh, family structures and um, say how are these people connected to, them, to each other Mm. And to what extent uh, are there intermarriages with uh, Chinese? Mm. I observed in, uh, in Shanghai that uh, there are a number of uh, Arab traders who were uh, living uh, close to the apartment I was renting uh, who had uh, Chinese uh, second wives. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, um, uh, so uh, part of the translation problem was uh, solved. I would also recommend that <laughs> to anyone who writes papers and doesn't know Chinese. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, where you can't, if you can't find something, yeah. go look somewhere else. That's, uh, sure. that's why I'm doing that. Uh, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> called, <laughs> P Peter, <laughs> Peter, that's called inter-discourse. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first question, passport. Uh, I checked that, I mean, also from my observation, most of those Indies are still holding Indian passport, even though they spend most of their life outside India. Because as I said, most of them have worked and done business in Dubai before. And UAE di didn't grant them any sense of passport, so they are still Indian citizens. But very few of them are holding Singapore passport. And they are, I mean, the Singapore passport, uh, Indians, I mean, Indians who are holding Singapore passport, they always say that I'm so proud to be a Singaporean because I can go anywhere, anywhere in this world without visa. And it's, that's, I mean, that's true because it's very important for traders to go anywhere in the world for their business. So there are some cases, I mean, in some cases, some Cindy's traders, because they have, I mean, office in Singapore as well. So they are doing some trade business between China and Singapore. So, I mean, but very few, I would say, only those high-end Cindy traders are Singaporean passport holders. <laughs> and another question is like um, the, the Sikhism issues. I mean, also refer to Tan San's earlier issues about the, the role of Gurdwara. Because since last year, November, the Sindhis or the Indian community in Kurtau, they set up a Gurdwara, a private Gurdwara, because in China you cannot set up a public Gurdwara, because the law still doesn't allow them to do so in China. And anyway, I mean, that Gurdwara, I went almost every day. <laughs> I mean, because I need to catch some Indians there, because that's obviously that's the place that you can find most Indian in one place and within the short, shortest period of time. But I found out that, because, I mean, previously I have done my research in the Gurdwara in Hong Kong. And I have done research there for five years already for my master study when I was studying in, China, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I mean, in Hong Kong Gurdwara, for example, you could find a lot of like business contact exchange, friends contact exchange, I mean, information exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Because obviously for new migrants, I mean, in particular, they need the social network. I mean, already available in those public religious space like Gurdwara in Hong Kong. But in Kertau, I didn't find that. 
all those Cindy's go there, I mean, they will only go there when, okay, my way, I mean, it is our family weddings and anniversary. I will go there and do the RD and I will go to the Gurdwara. Son's birthday, I will go to the Gurdwara. But most of the time, you see no people in the Gurdwara. <laughs> because, I mean, on the one hand, they, I mean, Kirtau Indians are a business community. So, and actually all those Cindy's, although some of them, they have very small, I mean, they have their own social circle. They need to interact with their family, their friends in Kirtau as well. But on the other hand, they are competitors with each other. Because they need to fight for, how to say, fight for suppliers, fight for overseas buyers. So in that sense, they are in one battlefield and they are fighting with each other. So I don't see any very strong sense of contact building process going on in the Kirtau Gurdwara. And so I think it's very different from the Gurdwara or other, for example, uh, the Gurdwara in UK, the Gurdwara in Canada, the Gurdwara in Hong Kong. It's very different. Because I've also done some research in the Gurdwara in Shanghai. It's also very different from the Gurdwara in Kirtau. Because in Shanghai, it is also a business community. But they are, I mean, all the Indians, Sindhis, Punjabis, I mean, Gujaratis, they are doing different kinds of trading business. So in that sense, I mean, you and me have no direct business con I mean, interest or conflict. But in Kirtau, yes, because they are all doing one item, fabrics. So in that sense, even within China, I mean, in China, there are three Gurdwara. One is in Shanghai, one is in Yiwu, and the uh, most recent one is in Kirtau, which is my field site. So in that sense, you can also see that kind of like group formation or group long formation going on in, I mean, within the Indian community in Kirtau. Um, I mean, intermarriage, interracial marriage, or inter ethnic marriage. Yes, I mean, uh, some Indians are married with the Chinese in Kirtau. And, but actually, many of them are just, I mean, having relationship with the Chinese girls. And the, I mean, the, I mean, give me, is it 15 minutes, right? I mean, yeah, yeah because I, I haven't read it's my class. It's almost 15, there's yeah, no one minute. I haven't read my class, you I just have see to, it. You have to add five there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, where am I? Yeah, I mean, the inter-ethnic marriage between Chinese uh, girls and the Indian boys. Uh, crazy world, like, I mean, as I mentioned in the paper, like... You have to explain that. Yeah, I mean, it's worth explaining, because I have many cases, like, one Indian guy have four Chinese girlfriends within the same time. And they can change these four girls every month. Why? I mean, of, of course, I mean, they're in love relations, so that's why they lead each other, I mean, they need to take care of each other, etc., etc. But I found out that, I mean, because I, I always heard those Chinese boys and, I mean, I, I mean, Indian boys and Chinese girls' conversation, the Indian boys always borrow those Chinese girls' bank account to have their money transferred. Because that can, I mean, because, I mean, as I said in the paper as well, it depends on your company registration. If you are not registered as a local company, you cannot do direct business with the Chinese suppliers. So, I mean, no record should be sold on your local Chinese bank account. So what they can do is like borrow some Chinese girls account to do the business with the Chinese suppliers or to take the commission or to pay the deposit to the Chinese factories. So in that sense, it is also, how to say, I mean, it has its purpose to, for those Indians to meet so many Chinese girls in one time because... Okay, Kajin, uh, let me interrupt. Yeah. What, what kind of social problems does that create? It, it, what is the social implications of that? Uh, uh, is there any social implications or is there just... Yeah. Uh, what is it? And, and, and I think I'll push you into answering mm. uh, the question both I and Prasenjit had. What does this mean to India? India-China China relations. Okay, answer the social issue. Having okay. four girlfriends, okay. what is the social implication? I mean, as I said, you need the Chinese friends to lend you the bank account to have your money transferred. Because otherwise, if, you, if that record is on your company bank account, bank book, uh, if you are a trading company, you need to pay the tax. If you are a representative office, it's, I mean, you violate the law already because you cannot do direct business. Why not from Chinese boys? Um, <laughs> Good question. Yeah, but generally speaking, most of those Chinese workers working in the Indian company are girls. Because, I mean, how to say, it's also quite related to the textile trading business environment. 
you need to talk with people and they feel that girl is better. So they use the employ the girls to do the things they want. So they meet the girls in the working place. But let me just give me 30 seconds to answer that Indian China, because it's really important, right? It's Indian China conference, right? Uh, because I, I want to provide, I mean, I mean I've, I've one thinking in my mind that I want to provide a critique to those kind of like Indian China study through my ethnographic cases. Because Indian China study used to be include Indian China as two nation states. But I found that Indian China interaction are more, how to say, interesting on the one hand. And actually, it's quite important in terms of trade. When you look into those actors on the field, Indian traders, Chinese suppliers, I mean, because as I, I have a very rough estimation, like over one fifth, I mean, of the clothes that we, that we are wearing at this moment are from Kerchao. <laughs> so over one fifth, twenty percent, about about twenty percent. Yeah. So I mean, in that sense, Indian China study is not important itself, but it's also important to see how those Indian and Chinese are taking a um, important role in exporting fabrics and making such a such kind of global textile economy. That's it. Sorry, we need to yeah. right here. But thank you so much.